the best response you can have to a payoff in a thriller is someone goes, oh, right, I forgot, of course, I should have played this. Fawn Story offers a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. All of our content is recorded live at Austin Film Festival and at our year-round events. To view previous episodes, visit OnStory.tv. OnStory is brought to you in part by the Alice Kleberg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. From Austin Film Festival, this is On Story, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. This week's On Story, Veep showrunner, David Mandel. Our entire show is always based on Selena makes a mistake and then pays the price for that mistake. That's every episode of Veep, if you look at them kind of deep down. She tries to do something, she screws up, and then whatever it is she wanted, she doesn't get. In this episode, Veep showrunner David Mandel discusses his role at the helm of the critically acclaimed comedy series. So the big question for me is after so many um, great opportunities in comedy where you uh, uh, have clearly spent a lot of time, why did you make the switch and choose to go into reality television? Well, in my defense, when we started, <laughs> It was still fiction. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, that's kind of why we ended it. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I've said this elsewhere, it just got impossible. In the uh, second to last episode of the show, um, we had done this runner all year where uh, Jonah, uh, who was running for president, um, as, he, as his sort of campaign got like worse and worse and worse, um, and uh, he was in the middle of, you know, he had fully embraced the uh, anti-vax movement um, and then had spread chicken pox as sort of a patient zero all around the United States among the unvaccinated. Um, at the very end, he blamed chicken pox on immigrants and created a no one in, no one out policy. Um, but uh, somewhere in there, there was this runner where he would yell about, like he would mention Selena Meyer, and the cra someone in the crowd would yell, kill her. And then another time, someone mentioned, you know, he mentioned something else, and someone just yelled randomly, kill her. Um, and in that episode, it got to immigrants, and someone yelled, kill them. And he sort of was like, no, 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 not, no, no, you wouldn't, you know, and, and then kind of, then started to talk about what he thought good and bad immigrants were. Anyway, that aired on a Sunday. Wednesday uh, in like, I think it was like Panama City, Florida, because, well, everything happens in Florida. Um, Trump was on stage and literally said something about immigrants and someone in his crowd really yelled, shoot them, at which point he laughed. And at that point, if we weren't a thousand percent sure that it was time to end Veep, we were a million percent sure it was time. Uh, it just, you know, what can I say? We were trying to write a show about the worst president in the world with the most incompetent staff, and we were coming in second on a, <laughs> you know, on like a daily basis. So, yeah. I, I should, sorry, I should point out, just for the record, since we're, we're taping this, uh, the show does not denote party. Uh, the show never mentioned Democrats. It never mentioned Republicans. Uh, we would pick and choose issues so that Selena was a fabulous mix-up of sometimes, I guess, for abortion, against abortion, for guns, against guns. You know, there was no real party to her, and we, we studiously avoided it. We really can't talk about the boat right now because, Mike, we're trying to figure out how I think about 
this issue. Okay, you well, know? the Post actually wants to know if you've changed your stance on abortion, RE. Huh. Yeah. So you could say, as a woman, I believe No, that no, 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 no. I can't identify myself as a woman. People can't know that. Men hate that. And women who hate women hate that, which I believe is most women. Don't you agree with that, Yes, Amy? and ma'am, we should really uh, bag this up and take it back to D.C. Yeah. Good idea. Right. You have your own way of doing things, and you've got to come into an established fan base and product and new cast. What I'd really love to hear about is how you, when that opportunity first arose, how you started to work through it in your head about how you're going to approach this, and then what you actually did when you entered the show. You know, when I got the phone call, it was sort of very out of the blue. Um, and I was hesitant. I mean, I don't know what else to say. Not not scared, not nervous, just hesitant. Um, because, well, why wouldn't you be? I was a huge fan of the show. Um, it, it obviously very much had a voice. Um, it just sort of was like, huh, okay. So, you know, you don't, you don't jump at these things. And I'll be very honest, um, you know, you start meetings, you start talking to people, but really it was when they gave me this, and, and look, you know, Julie and I had known each other on Seinfeld. We sat down um, and had a very sort of casual and very nice conversation and look, I guess I would have probably taken the job just to work with Julia again. I mean, she's, however good you guys think she is, she's that much better than what you think she is. And most of you guys probably think she's pretty fantastic. Um, I mean, she's just an incredible combo of both, you know, the acting part, but also the comedy chops. But the real truth is, it was when I got the scripts and some of the rough cuts for what was um, season four. Um, and season four is the season that ends with the electoral college tie. And it was really, I guess, really my writer's ego that I was so fascinated. I love the ending. I love the notion of the tie. It seemed like such an impossible corner to leave the show in, to walk away and kind of just go, it's a tie, goodbye. Um, <laughs> It, it just, I, 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 it, I mean, it was one of those things where I just couldn't stop thinking about the tie and how to resolve it and what would be the funniest way to resolve it. And as I started thinking, the pieces just started kind of coming out of me. And, you know, I would have these conversations with Julie and each time it was like I'd bring a little more. So first it was sort of really just thinking about, well, should she win or should she lose? And what she wants in the world most is the presidency, she has to lose. So, okay, she's gonna lose. And then start thinking about, well, who should she lose to? What if she loses to another woman? And then at that point, it was sort of like, I had no choice but to take the job. You know what I mean? There's been enough uncertainty in this country, so I won't stall any Can further. Can you please? Please. 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 You're on TV. Keep this in mind, out. I vote for Senator Lara Montes. It's official. The United States of America has a new president. At the beginning of a Veep season, just to guys give you sort of an example, the, when the season starts, I usually, before, like a week before the season starts, I have like lunch with the writers, and I usually hit them with the first scene, the last scene, and sort of what I think is happening during this, this, this year that's going to come. And then it's like, see you in a week. So that way I've sort of planted the seeds with them and they're at least thinking about it. So we, we, when we hit the ground running on, you know, whatever the first Monday, they've had a chance to digest those ideas as opposed to wasting, you know, sort of the first week that way. Um, and during those early times, we're constantly bringing in, like if I know like this last year, where we knew she was gonna be running and we were gonna be starting in Iowa, we just start bringing in guests. So every day there's like a lunch guest or something, kind of like a salon. So we're bringing in reporters, people that worked on the Obama campaign, people that worked on, you know, uh, previous campaign, you know, just different interesting people. And we're getting stuff from them constantly. So for example, and I've told this story elsewhere, uh, Tommy Vitor, one of the Pod Saves America guys, who was uh, one of the guys in charge of Obama in Iowa, told us a story when he came in about Obama, them landing at the wrong airport. And the second we heard that, that actually became the first scene of, that replaced, and that was like, oh, that's the new first scene of the, of the season. Hello, Iowa, I'm... Selena Meyer. Wait a minute, where is everyone? Maybe they're hiding. What? Amy, where are you? At the airport, where are you? I mean, there's only one 
runway. I'm at the airport. We just landed. That's not possible. Right now, I'm standing here with my in my hand in Cedar Falls, Iowa. Ma'am, we're in Cedar Rapids. No! This is supposed to be now, Selena! Now! Where I do think the room is incredibly valuable uh, for is punch up. And I had a, you know, killer room that just uh, constantly added jokes to the script. Um, and then HBO, which was very rare, allowed me to keep the staff on all through shooting. So most of the time when I'm shooting, yeah, we're never, we never have all the scripts done, so there's always somebody back behind working on something. But more often than not, I'm at the monitor, whether I'm directing or whether someone else is directing and I'm just you know at the monitor, I have eight or 10 writers sitting behind me like throwing additional jokes at me so that every moment of silence that you're watching, if there's a hole, we're gonna fill it. We're gonna just keep adding lines, just jam it full. And then obviously later in the edit room, cutting every extraneous sentence I don't need so I can leave as many of those jokes as possible, cutting out every pause I can humanly cut out and just trying to achieve that sort of speed that I love. Anyway, that's kind of, that's how we write Veep. It's like words are your second language, sir. Well, thanks for the feedback. Joan Ryan. Oh, yeah. That's a name that keeps popping up. Well, I'm a uh, popular guy. <laughs> Richard T. Splett. Don't know why I said T. My middle name's John. You you added some stuff. I mean, Richard yeah. Splett is one of my favorite characters now in all of television, and he seemed to just come out of awesome. nowhere. He's yes, awesome. yes, and, yeah. and then became... Um, there's, I think, look, I think by definition, there are also certain things that as... As, as me that I had that, you know, the Armando and the Brits didn't have. I had a much more of a working knowledge of American politics and American history. So when you watch my episodes, you will hear references to things like the Spanish-American War that they just wouldn't have done because they're not, it, they're not taught about the Spanish-American War. Um, we, you know, I think we reference more candidates. I think we reference people out of history more. Because it was season five, there was an opportunity in ways you couldn't have in season one to kind of dig into who these people were so that like you've had four years of Selena doing all of this horrific narcissism and whatnot. Well, we've referenced her mother once or twice. Let's, let's find out more about what makes her tick. Um, and that was definitely something they did not do. They sort of almost stayed away from quote unquote home life. And we didn't do a lot of it, but I thought it was a chance to really dig into who these characters were and sort of expand the palette of the show. Um, and so I'll end on this one other point, which gets me back to your actual question, which is I was a fan of the show. So I'm sitting there and I'm watching the show and there were definitely things that I remembered and wondered about. So for example, like, um, the reference to Labor Day, uh, if you're a fan of the show, it was this mysterious moment between Gary and Selena where something happened on Labor Day. As a fan, I will always wondered what Labor Day was, and so for me it was like, well, I don't know if we're gonna say what it is, but we're gonna try and put in a couple of other pieces of information about Labor Day that make it more interesting. So you thought it was a day, and we later revealed it was a boat. Again, that came out of being a fan of the show, and seeing these sort of, like whether they were threads or things I remembered or things I liked. And so with Richard, um, I mean, Sam was just so good. And this idea of what if he's an election expert and now because of this tie, like, you know, all of a sudden he's sort of thrust ahead of Jonah and they're, they're sort of, they're related. And so that's, that's as simple as where it started. And then once it was kind of going, it was like, oh God, what if she trusts Richard also more than Amy? And that starts to drive Amy crazy. And, and in some ways that basically led to, what if we come back a year later and Richard's her chief of staff? And at some point it became, what if one day Richard actually is president of the United States? And that's how those things grow. But it really came out of, um, 
I guess being a fan of the show and then getting to go work on the show. Presidential motorcade has arrived, and here comes President of the United States, Richard Splett, and the First Lady, Annette Splett. Somber but elegant, basking in the glow of a landslide re-election following President Splett's historic three-state solution Middle East peace agreement, for which he won the Nobel Prize. Richard did become a great catalyst to dredge up the really screwed up relationships all these people actually had and and to sort of bring out some of their worst traits you know? he also in a world of a lot of horrible characters <laughs> who i guess my biggest fear always is making sure that nobody sounds the same that was a, always a a worry for me writing veep is just that even when they're horrible and vindictive that they sound different that an amy dan an amy line has to sound different than a dan line and both of them have to sound different than a selena line what well, you know etc richard is a different energy he's got a kindness to him he's sort of uh he still i think believes in government and so he, that energy and then that voice and then that voice started to we really did pick up on that sort of line he did, again, before I was there, which was Richard T. Splett, I don't know why I said that, my middle name is John, of him, <laughs> de of him delivering information uh -huh. and then undercutting his own information. <laughs> um, and my absolute favorite one that I will, you know, and I, I, uh, well, the, my, I have two favorites that uh, I, Sam knows I love. Um, uh, which was one was at the very end of the season when Selena lost and she's sitting there with Richard in the White House in the middle of the night and she's drunk and whatever and he's talking to her she's talking about loss and he goes oh my auntie was always like that and whatever and then he goes you know actually she was more like a sister to me or an older sister to me I was raised by my grandmother and he goes, wait a second, and he realizes his aunt was his mother, and then his what he, the woman he thought was his mother was his grandmother, which uh, is like, it, it's like it, Sam just, I mean, like just like talk about just a monster home run. If I was a little girl and you said to me, what do you want to do? I would have said, please, can I be president? And then it turned out to be the, the 12 loneliest months of my life. My auntie used to talk about loneliness like that. Okay, so right, you know that. Yeah, yeah. We were uh, pretty, pretty close, especially because my, my, my mother was so much older, old enough to be my grandmother, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe my auntie was actually my real mother, and my mother was actually my grandmother. Ah, wow, that's starting to make a whole lot of sense. Everybody knew about it but me, too. Looking at topically each episode, what you're doing compared to what is happening in the moment in the world, and how much are you really trying to pay attention to that, and how much are you just throwing it all to the wind because God knows what's going to happen next, you know? We sort of did two seasons in one way and a final season in a very different way. Um, up till the final season, just to try and answer that quickly, um, we weren't paying particularly much attention to what was happening on a given day other than sort of listening for, you know, funny, interesting things like, you know, as I said, an all-male women's reproductive health thing, which was a relatively, at the time, current thing that had happened that we sort of took from. But at the same time, we were always trying to really avoid, in some ways, what was going on right then. You know, we always, I don't think we ever mentioned a president after Reagan. That's kind of where the, the timeline split. So again, we took influence from everywhere, but you know, we weren't worrying much about it. We started putting the final season together. We had the season together. It was all mapped out. We were starting writing. We had three or four scripts written. Um, and the Sunday, uh, sorry, the Monday after we won the second Emmy, uh, Julie, I got a phone call and uh, of course, Julia had cancer, um, and he was calling to let me know that she wanted to talk so that she could tell us what was going on. So now we're shutting, obviously very quickly we shut down. We did a couple of table reads um, to kind of keep going. Um, it, it was something she wanted to do so that she would do it, um, and she's talked about this, um, she would um, finish a, a chemo cycle, and right before starting the next one, we would do a table read to kind of lift her spirits and whatnot. And uh, January rolled around, we had been, we were shut down, and basically, all of a sudden, great news, everything is looking good. We don't know exactly when we're starting, but we're gonna be back. And this coincided with the second year of the Trump presidency. The second year of the Trump presidency, I think everyone would agree, was when Trump started to feel comfortable 
in office and really ramped up the Trumpiness. And as that was going on, I'm sort of staring at our 10 episodes and I'm sort of wondering, is this show relevant? Does this show make any sense? All the things that you start to really worry about in a way that I'd never worried about it. And among those things was we still had in that incarnation, Julia was gonna get, uh, sorry, Selena was gonna get to the end of the season, uh, the brokered convention, which is what happened, and she was going to lose the presidency. Jonah, she was gonna offer Jonah the vice presidency, and then he was going to have a list of demands uh, that he wanted as the vice president, and the list, while the list of demands was sort of happening, Tom James was gonna storm the floor as a write-in candidate, steal the nomination away because Jonah sort of took too long, and Selena was gonna lose. I wanna offer Jonah the VP slot. What? What? Yeah, it's the only move we oh. have left now, and we're gonna have to get it done today. Oh, ma'am, there yes. are still numerous permutations that can play out here. You don't have to do this. Do the Islamic math. You're the numbers guy. F the numbers! I will not be part of a campaign, let alone an administration that includes Jonah Ryan as vice president. That is an entirely unacceptable outcome. Our entire show is always based on Selena makes a mistake and then pays the price for that mistake. That's every episode of Veep, if you look at them kind of deep down. She tries to do something, she screws up, and then whatever it is she wanted, she doesn't get. It was a great formula, but it stopped feeling like reality. It stopped feeling, it seemed like you make a mistake and the country doesn't really remember it five minutes later and rewards you for it. And so basically in that sort of nether time before we were back, I just sort of pulled the show apart and just started thinking this is not reflecting now. And it was very hard because obviously you do worry about, we're not Saturday Night Live, we're not on every night, we're not on every Saturday. So we weren't gonna make the show about what did he say that week. But you try, and this is what Veep has always done, you try and get above it as much as possible and go, what is this about? And so, it, you know, this, the notion of an authoritarian regime, let's not worry about Trump or this guy or this guy, but why are there authoritarian regimes coming to sort of, to power? Let's not do fake news, which is the thing Trump says, but let's try and address why, why are, bless you, why are facts and science sort of getting warred upon? And that's how we kind of led our way to a lot of the Jonah stuff, especially his war on math and his, you know, um, and, 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 you know, and you can laugh, but I hope you can see the connections to what we were trying to do. And it was really hard because obviously, throughout the season, people kept going, oh, you're, you know, she's Trump, he's Trump, he's Kellyanne, she's Kellyanne. And look, yes, but no, and I guess that's the thing, but we were trying to adjust a show that very quickly seemed out of date. When you watch, go back and watch, I don't know, you know, in my first season, we did the president is tweeting joke. That seems like it was written in the 1800s now. Hi, ma'am, if you hear this, do not tweet, please. Mike, Stop. what are you doing? You tweeted. What? About O'Brien, it wasn't nice. I just direct messaged Charlie. No, it was yes. public. Everybody yes. saw it on Twitter. No, they Wait, didn't. What did yes. you tweet? What, it was just some funny joke. No, I was just making, it was, making, it was oh, what? I pushed that, I the feather button. I know, you tweet, oh, it was, that's a tweet. Oh. Yes, we have that's seen That's a it. tweet. Not... Well, then delete it. Delete it. Delete it. It's impossible. Just delete, no, delete it. it. You know, the whole show seems, I hate to say this, somewhat of another time. Almost the same thing with the West Wing. These, they, they seem like this, like, if I said to you, when is Veep about? You'd be like, oh, it's the 60s. You know what I mean? It, it just seems like a different show. And so we really did have to change the show in that final season. And it got nastier, and it got meaner, and it got bleaker, and it got more horrible. And part of that was, I felt it had to, because these are horrible, bleak times. But I will also point out, it was built not to sustain, meaning you don't do that for 10 more seasons. You do that knowing this is the final season and we are going to build to the bleakest of all endings, which is she is going to ultimately, where story meets character, you know, the most important things you can do in any writing, she is going to throw Gary, the only person in some ways that she ever actually cared for, she is going to put a bullet in his head, a la Fredo. 
And when you realize that that's where we're building to, she has to take this journey into a just a darker place so that she can do the one thing you never thought she would do. And she does it and you hate her for it and she pays a horrific price. But that, I guess, to me, ta-da, that's politics. I wanted to say a word about sacrifice. It means to lose something for the greater good. And when I look back on my 52 years with almost 30 of them spent in public service, there is no one who has sacrificed more than me. And there's nothing anyone can do to stop me. You've been watching On Writing Veep on On Story. On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story project, including the On Story PBS series, now streaming online, the On Story radio program, the On Story podcast, and the On Story book series, available where books are sold. To find out more about On Story and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com. Want to see On Story live? Join us at Austin Film Festival's annual Writers' Conference each October. Visit www.austinfilmfestival.com to find out more about badges and passes to attend the festival.